you to hop on, but we're going to go ahead and get started because we have just an hour here over lunch with you guys today. I am Jill Walsh with Prevent Child Abuse Georgia. We are housed in the School of Public Health at Georgia State University. Um, we really work to do a lot of connecting people to awareness around what primary prevention is and looks like and can be throughout the state. Um, and we do that a lot through education trainings like today, this webinar. We also have a lot of training series on our website. And we also run the 1-800-CHILDREN helpline, which we're about to relaunch and rebrand. But we really focus on connecting people with supportive programs throughout the state of Georgia, as we believe um, concrete supports are a really big part of primary prevention. And so I want to wish everyone a happy Child Abuse Prevention Month. We hope that you guys are all engaged in local activities or even at the state level. And you are today part of our community learning series for Child Abuse Prevention Month. And so we had one last week. Um, today we have creating trauma-informed community spaces. And then we have another two webinars for the next two weeks going forward as well on our website. But today we're so excited to have um, Elise Stangle, who is a social worker at the Athens Regional Library System, and also Trudy Green, who is the Assistant Director for Public Services at Athens Regional Library. And so in 2018, athens Clark County Library became the first trauma-informed library in the nation. And since then have really worked to build a robust program there um, that we can all learn a lot from. And so we know building a trauma-informed spaces and especially in non-traditional areas. So not just within the child welfare system, but where are our families and communities really spending a lot of time and engaging? How do we make those trauma-informed as well? And so with that, I want to pass it off to our presenters and please put your questions in the chat box. We will be holding them until the end though. So thank you guys. And I'll hand it over to Trudy and Elise. Thank you, Jill. And um, I'm Trudy. I'm Trudy Green. I'm the Assistant Director for Public Services at the athens Clark County Library. And um, Elise will uh, take over for the second part of the webinar. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to share our program with you today. Um, we have, um, I think that the audience here is definitely more familiar with being trauma-informed than those of us in the library were ever familiar with being trauma-informed. So a lot of this is really how we got to where we are now. So um, as I said, I'm the Assistant Director for Public Services here at the library. And um, I've been at this library for about 16 years, but I've been in libraries for a whole lot longer and seen a lot of changes. And this is one of the, uh, uh, definitely a very positive change on how we reach out and help patrons. Um, as Jill said, in 2018, we got the grant from, um, it's a community catalyst grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services or IMLS. And part of the grant was to form the Trauma-Informed Library Transformation, which we also call TILT. There was a lot of other things in the grant, but of course today we'll just be talking about the tilt part. Um, the idea was to start a trauma-informed library uh, to be among the first, if not the first in the nation. Um, again, in libraries, trauma-informed was really new and we were trying to figure out what does it mean and where do we go from here. Um, in Athens, um, sorry, advance my slides. I get to talking and I forget what I'm doing. It was a $100,000 grant and it was a two year program with the University of Georgia School of Social Work. The, uh, I'm sure everyone here probably is familiar with Athens, Georgia. Um, our library system is the Athens Regional Library System. We cover five counties in Northeast Georgia. We have 11 libraries. You can see that we, we have about um, 230,000 populations served. A fraction of those are card holders. Uh, that, that number is probably about a year old, so maybe it's a little bit more. Um, Athens itself, uh, if you're in Georgia, you know that Athens is um, a great town to live in. There's lots of stuff to do here. Um, it's, uh, the population is about 127,000, of which 38,000 are here to attend the University of Georgia. 
Um, it tends to be a, a pretty rural area, although Athens is itself is not rural. rural. Um, Athens is consistently named um, one of the best college towns or best places to retire. You can see the demographics of the community, 58% white, 24% black, and about 11% Hispanic. So in Athens, there is a lot of education attainment because of the university largely, and a lot of people that have, um, say, high incomes or upper middle class incomes. But there's also this side of Athens that's below poverty level, which is about 30% of our population is below poverty level. Um, these, a lot of people are um, unemployed or underemployed, unhoused, low education attainment. Uh, last year, the high school graduation rate was um, 81%, which is uh, lower than, than what's on that uh, graphic. Um, that's something that we have really struggled with in the community is high school graduation. Um, there's an issue with homelessness. The point in time count that was done in January had 128 individuals experiencing homelessness. And then there were additional ones who were like un underhoused or something like that. But that's a bit high for our community, our size. Um, we're not unique in the makeup of the very well educated and those who are struggling in disadvantage. In fact, uh, at one time, Athens had the highest per capita poverty rate for a community its size. But Athens is a progressive town. Uh, the government and the residents here tend to be very progressive. And there's a lot of nonprofits and there have over the years been lots of um, efforts to improve conditions for all the residents here and the quality of life. And so this is a situation we were in in 2018 when um, we wrote and got the trauma-informed library grant. So um, libraries in, excuse me, social workers in libraries is a kind of a new concept. They've been around for I don't know, 10, 15 years, probably not 15 years. When we got the grant, there were about two dozen libraries in the country that had social workers. Um, it's a bit more now, but to understand why a library would need a social worker or social services in the library, think about what we do in public libraries. We're open to everyone. Everything that we have for the most part is free. A person can come in, they could use the computer, they could read. Sometimes they come in and they sleep and they're not going to be disturbed. They're not going to be hassled. As long as they're complying with policies, they're not gonna to have to buy something in order to stay here. Uh, libraries are thought of as a safe space. And many of the people who come here, um, not just those experiencing homelessness, they come here and they're seeking assistance that goes beyond what we would call a regular reference question. They might be help finding housing or medical care or a hot meal. And these are types of questions that our frontline staff is not always able to deal with. Um, I can say from experience, because I also work with the public, uh, that we help people all the time who have been sent by an agency to apply for maybe their SNAP benefits and they'll just say, you know, go to the library and you can use the computer and someone will be there to help you. And, and we are, and we do help them. Um, a lot of people still don't have computer skills. I just helped a lady um, last week or the week before who was signing up for some service. I can't even remember what it was, but I do remember that she couldn't use the computer and she had a lot of trouble and we were able to help her, but that's not an uncommon thing to see in our public library and I'm sure um, other public libraries too. Those uh, websites can be really complicated even for someone with experience. And so you have someone with no computer experience trying to sign up for benefits or something. It's, it's really a struggle and a burden. So the library social worker helps connect uh, people to services. And it's an example of helping people where they are. And it's a way for our library to uh, better serve our community. And that's just the social worker part. Again, with the trauma-informed 
that was a really a really new concept for us um, in the world of libraries. And I know that in you know your field and in social work, it's very common. But it was really, it was a struggle to kind of comprehend for me what it meant to be trauma informed. And I know that everyone here does probably does understand what trauma informed is. And this is the definition we were given was to realize the impact of trauma, recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma and integrate that into our policies and practices and resist further harm. And this came up because in order to be trauma informed, we have to train our staff. And the first training we did was cleverly titled A Social Worker Walks in a Library. And this is what the trainer went over of how to recognize trauma and signs of trauma. But that's just the clinical definition. And what does that mean in the public library when I've got you know, about 60 people who um, are frontline staff and not counting the people who work behind the scenes? How do we incorporate those um, in that into our services that we regular, regularly offer? Libraries are already, like I said, considered a safe space. People can come in regardless of their social socioeconomic status. And we provide assistance. We identify resources. Um, people that we help daily, sometimes they're not at their best. You know, they, they, they're having a bad day they're brusque, they're rude, um, they have trauma in their lives and they come into the library and they need help. And what we want to do as library staff at our library is always help people to the best we can without judgment, even if they're not having their best day. And so to me, even though we weren't trauma informed, we were already incorporating a lot of being trauma informed into our regular customer service. And so in many ways, it was, it was pretty easy to incorporate the trauma-informed definition into the services that we offered. And so we did this, we had uh, four tiers, I guess, four tiers of what we were doing. Again, the staff training was the, one of the most important parts. Uh, we had social work interns from the University of Georgia. We had policy, uh, community partnerships and we also institute a policy uh, review with our partners at the University of Georgia. And so staff training to me really is the, is the key here for being trauma informed because it's that training that makes us trauma informed rather than a library that has social workers. So you can see these are the few trainings that we were able to offer. We did uh, QPR, which is suicide prevention there was a social worker walked into a library. We did empathy and self-care and we did de-escalation techniques. Um, empathy and self-care was really important because as we were taught, when you have a situation with a patron who is not at their best, it, it, can, it can be rough. And um, we want staff to know that that's okay. And it's really important to take care of yourself after um, after a situation like that. Then another thing we did was we had the social work interns, and I think Elise is probably going to talk more about this, but um, our partner was the, the University of Georgia School of Social Work, and so we brought in the three, three interns. Um, and what we were wondering when we first brought in the interns, what the staff was always asking me was, how are we gonna work with the interns? How do we incorporate those into our services? I think the staff was really concerned that as um, people came in and need assistance and the social work interns weren't there, that the staff would be expected to take over even though they're not social workers or in school or don't have that training. And I think that was the kind of the biggest question that we had is how do we connect uh, patrons to the social worker? If you think about, um, public libraries and how we do help people. And you may not be familiar with this, but we, someone could come in like the person who was asking me last week for whatever that assistance was. We can take them to the website. We can help them get logged in. We can help provide, you know, basic navigations, um, advice or guidance to them, but we can't go beyond that. 
um, as library professionals. Um, that's just not within our ethics. So we couldn't say, well, I see you're signing up for these benefits. Maybe you should look at these benefits too, which is something definitely the social work and the social work interns could do. And the funny thing was that even though the staff's biggest concern was how to incorporate getting the patrons to the social workers, that ended up not being an issue at all. The staff were really quick to catch on that the person they were helping could be better served by working with one of our social work interns. So that was actually really, really successful. So we had um, the three interns, we had three interns and they, when they weren't helping our patrons, they were tabling. Here's a picture of our, these are our first year interns. They were doing some tabling. We would invite community groups to table with us, which was really, really successful. They created a spreadsheet of um, agencies and social services in the community to help with the referrals. And then one of the things we did that I think was most successful was, was with the databases, we paired the librarians and the social workers to go out and visit the, some of the agencies. They would go and they would um, uh, visit the agency, ask some questions, learn more about it. And then the agency would learn more about the library and about this program. Um, it, it was really very successful. It was good for the interns. They saw the agency and um, one, of the social, one of the interns told me that she felt so much more confident in referring someone to an agency that she had visited than from the other ones. And just from a professional uh, standpoint with the librarians, it was very beneficial to them because it gave them networking and outreach experience that um, sometimes it's hard to come by in, in our public library. So it was really, really successful. Um, really uh, glad that we were able to do that. And so, all right, we had the interns, we had the training, we had the staff buy-in. We had patrons coming in specifically to see the social work interns, they were being referred. And then we had the pandemic and everything came to a standstill. The interns went home, the library closed its doors to in-person services. The people who needed help the most had, you know, few resources and they certainly didn't have the library to come into every day um, to get, you know, warm or whatever to come into the library. So they have fewer resources. And that's where we were for about a year. Um, so we've been fully reopened for about a year now. We were able to bring on Elise as the part-time social worker. Um, she has brought intern Bex, and again, she's going to talk about that. But the one thing that we have lost is the training aspect, the trauma-informed, because we've had so much staff turnover since the pandemic started um, that we have not been able to offer the amount of training for being trauma-informed that, that we had hoped to be able to offer because the pandemic just brought everything to a standstill. And that's something Elise and I have talked about, um, how to get that training to the staff so that we can live up to being trauma-informed as opposed to a library with a social worker, which is still really great. Um, that is the end of my part, and I'm going to stop sharing. Well, I'm going to share another screen, but I'm going to exit this for Elise's uh, program. And I just want to share something about Elise that she's probably not going to share about herself. Um, Elise is our first social worker. Before she was our social worker, she was a librarian on our team. And the staff is so thrilled to have Elise on board. She is the perfect combination of someone who understands library patrons and someone who understands the needs through a social work lens. And so we are just so thrilled to have Elise on board. Oh, thank you, Trudy. Okay, I'm gonna share yours now and then I'm gonna mute. Okay. Okay, so some of this initial stuff, uh, we weren't quite sure who our audience was going to be today. So we can kind of go through um, a little bit of the trauma-informed piece. Um, so Trudy did her report on the initial grant and, and how they implemented that. 
And so it does sound like y'all mostly know what it means to be trauma informed, but it means um, to recognize the impact of trauma, toxic stress, adverse childhood experiences, and recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma, fully integrate this knowledge into policies, procedures, and practices, resist further harm, and seek to avoid re-victimization. So what does this mean for the library? I think that's the question. This is definitely um, an approach that has come from medical care and then has been very embraced by education. But what does it mean for a different type of organization completely? So um, the six key principles of a trauma-informed approach are safety, trustworthiness, transparency, peer support, collaboration, empowerment, voice and choice, and cultural, historical, and gender issues. So looking at the library, uh, Trudy talked a lot about how the library is usually seen as a safe space in the community. And so that is really, um, go back to the, the six principles. We're gonna talk about these for a minute. Thank you, Trudy's running my slides today. So, um, so I wanna just look at how these apply to a library setting and what we've um, talked about as far as implementing them there. So, so safety, we, we have the advantage of being seen as a safe place, a safe community place where everyone can go um, and people come there of their own free will, no one's having to go there. Uh, but we do have the downside of being a very open environment. So, which means a lot of things are outside of our control. Um, someone might be having a meltdown nearby, there might be kids yelling, there might be babies crying. There's, we do as much as we can to control the safety of the environment, but there's, there are also always going to be a lot of factors outside of our control. Um, so we take care to mim minimize those and we have spaces that are more quiet zones, we have security that comes through and they're very supportive as well. Um, but that's one aspect that we work on at the library. Um, trustworthiness and transparency. Um, so we have a lot of different policies and sometimes I think people can feel that those policies can be arbitrary. And so with trustworthiness and transparency at the library, <clears throat> um, we try and have be very clear about our policies when they apply, what behavior is acceptable and what's not. Um, and so that's usually behavior that doesn't bother anyone else is fine, even if it's something that might not be a quite traditional use of the library. We sometimes have people complain about other patrons not doing things properly, but as long as they're not destroying anything, you know, damaging the library and they're not bothering other patrons, that is fine. We support someone's um, desire to play video games in one of our study rooms all day. We had someone who brings in his own system and sometimes does that. Um, so, so trustworthiness and transparency, we try to be very clear about what's acceptable and what's not. And if we're asking someone to stop doing something, why it's not acceptable at the library. Uh, peer support is a little less applicable to the library than other organizations. I think it mostly shows up in staff and staff supporting each other. Um, this has been a really trying time, I think, for all organizations, but one's just open to the public and having to still try and offer services during a pandemic has been pretty hard. And um, libraries as well, li and library staff get faced with a lot of vocational awe, um, an expectation that you are doing it for the love of what you're doing, not for, not for the pay, not for, um, anything else. You're doing it for, for the love of it. So it can be a job that is much more demanding than people expect with um, not always as much rewards. So peer support can be really valuable as a team embracing um, the side of trauma-informed care that makes sure that staff are safe, that staff has support. Um, collaboration. So I think this happens in two ways at the library um, or with our program. Basically, focusing on the importance of partnerships. We are one organization within a larger community system. And we are, like what Trudy was saying, where the librarians were reaching out to the other agencies. The library is trying to find the gaps in services and saying, what can we do for you? And what can you do for us to try and help make a better, basically social safety net and get people the resources they need. Um, 
and then uh, empowerment and um, voice and choice. This one also um, is a little bit unique, I think, as far as a library setting. Um, but it also makes sense because in the library, the patrons come to us. Uh, librarians don't go out talking to, you know, asking people exactly what they're looking for. They let people come to them and respect that autonomy. And so that's what we've been doing with the TILT program is allowing patrons to come to us. Um, even if someone does show up with a bag as big as they are and their boots tied to it, um, we let them decide that they want to come talk to us and we respect their um, their decision making about what the important issue for them of the day is. Sometimes it seems like the most important issue might be that they don't have a place to sleep that night, but for them the issue is they lost their phone and they need to call their friend. Um, sometimes it's just the little things. Um, and then cultural, historical, and gender issues. Um, I would guess that y'all might not be as aware, and I'm going to give a shout out to the library and just what I've learned about libraries since working there, is how much emphasis the library does put on acknowledging cultural, historical, and gender inequalities and issues. Um, acknowledging that the libraries have not always been a place for everybody, um, that there have been libraries segregated by gender, by race, um, that the Dewey Decimal System that we use for cataloging has its own biases, and that's something to be, uh, be aware of. And so libraries do take an active role in trying to increase social justice. Um, so those are some of the aspects that the ways that the six key principles of a trauma-informed approach can be applied at libraries. So we can, we can go on to the next slide. Thank you. So yes, trauma-informed care works to increase the survivor's sense of healthy choices and control over their healing process. So we allow them to come to us, say what's most important to them, is culturally competent, we do have a lot of folks from all backgrounds who come to us and a lot of folks experiencing other types of um, trauma and hardship. Um, and then understands that many behaviors started out as understandable attempts for the survivor to cope. So this is an important one because I think this is really important in talking to staff about it and creating a culture of trauma-informed care. Um, that a lot of behaviors maybe worked for them once. And it's not that they're doing it to be just annoying to us. It's that this is a co coping mechanism that no longer works for them. Um, and so I think that that's always an important one to kind of talk about with staff. Uh, and then takes each survivor, their experience and cultural context into consideration in order to develop appropriate strategies. Um, so, one thing about the library as well is we don't know anything about the people that come in. Um, they're not they're not coming into a school. They're not there for medical care. Like we don't even know their names a lot of times. We are we are coming in with a completely blank slate, um, and so we really don't know what kind of trauma history our patrons have. Um, it is pretty clear that a lot of our patrons do have have a history of trauma. And sometimes there's things that we do or other patrons do that can kind of trigger that trauma. And so we really, as a staff and a library culture, try and recognize that their, their own cultural context is coming into play. Um, it's often not about us as individuals. It's about everything else that's been going on in their lives. Okay. So the things that we're doing now, we did kind of have a break with the pandemic, but we are offering the on-site social services. So licensed master social worker at the library 16 hours a week, that's me. And we have two social work interns who are going through UGA's social work master's degree program. And between the three of us, we offer open office hours and appointments available. So someone can just walk in for something completely unrelated and maybe staff realizes that they have a social service need or they're asking more questions than staff can answer, they can send us to us. Or if we have someone that wants to set aside a specific amount of time for a specific thing, I, I put appointments as an hour and a half long. 
sometimes we have come in, people come in and they want to apply for a job or they want to apply for multiple jobs and we can help them with that. So we can also create a set amount of time for them to predict schedule come in for. Okay, we're also doing collaboration. It's kind of the second main part of what we're offering to people these days. Um, so some of the, the collaborations we've done is the Family Connection, um, Families and Schools and the Neighborhood Leaders Program, the Athens Area Diaper Bank, the Homelessness and Poverty Coalition, which is a local group of organizations that serve folks who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and that is a really valuable group to us. And the Advantage Homeless Day Service Center, we've talked to them specifically about partnerships as far as what we can provide and who sh we should send to them for assistance. And then also staff support. So up-to-date list of resources, giving them a referral option for questions and needs that are beyond the staff experience, um, crisis intervention, support debriefing, and then consultation on trauma-informed consequences. Um, that is something that I think can be, uh, it's, it's good to keep in mind. We had someone who was having some behaviors that we had told them weren't allowed in the library and it was suggested that maybe there should be a ban. And we talked about how this person is in the library every single day and a ban of a month to them would be like a ban of a year for anybody else based on just how much they depended on the library. Um, so you can go on to the next slide. Okay, so with the on-site social services, we have a indoor place to access charging stations, internet access, and specifically we have our own little office where we have a phone, we have power, we have laptops, we can shut the door and they can use that to apply for any benefits they need where we can talk about what they're putting in. Their private data is still, um, is basically secure and they have, they have privacy. Um, and so we assist, especially patrons with limited or beginning technology skills. That's actually how a lot of people kind of get identified to us is they're asking our computer people for a lot of assistance. And if, and if it's more assistance than, if, you know, if they need someone next to them, helping them with every question, or they're still learning how to use a mouse um, and don't really understand technology at all, they'll send them to us in our office and we can help them with that. And so we have assisted with resumes, job applications, even these days, the follow-up to getting a job offer online um, has involved someone had to do a personality test and online, and they sent them a link, and then someone had to fill out their background check online or their I-9 online. Like, it's, it doesn't stop after you do the initial um get the initial job even, which was something that I had dealt with, but it had been a minute. So I think people take for granted, if you, if you have the internet access, it's easy. If you don't, it's so much harder every step of the way. Um, we also assist with apartment searches and online housing applications. A lot of those are online right now. Um, and housing in Athens is one of our biggest needs, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, and then we also refer patrons to local services with information about who to talk to and what documentation they may need to have ready. Um, so we offer basically brokered case management and we try and have what we call a warm handoff. We want to know, you know, exactly what their hours are, if there's a particular person to talk to, you know, if they need to have a social security card for everyone in their family to access the services, if they need to call and make an appointment beforehand, they can't just show up. Those are the kinds of additional information that we try and have ready um, to refer people out to other community organizations. So, so offering the social services at the library, Trudy talked a lot about kind of the benefits on the library side and why everyone thought that this was a great idea, <clears throat> which I think it's a great idea, but it, to put it in more formal, formal terms, offering social services in the library gives patrons access to strength-based person-centered brokerage case management in a place where they feel safe and often have social connections. Um, 
and collaborations expand access to services, information, and opportunities for underserved populations. So we have a chart about the things we've been asked about so far. So this is only 2022. Um, this is not any of the previous, previous questions, but you can see housing is one of our biggest at 31%, jobs um, and support for jobs at 18%. Um, technology help is actually probably a little bit low there. Other resources, we have a lot of random requests and I love that about the job. <laughs> Um, people know what they need and if we can help them, we can. So we're always learning as well. Um, identifying documents is a really big one. People have trouble getting access to any services if they don't have a state ID. They can't get a state ID if they don't have a birth certificate. They can't get a birth certificate if they don't have any proof of who they are. Um, so we have a combination of things we can do at the library and to know who else in the community helps with those services. Uh, so one of our local organizations will make a little ID for people. So they have their first ID and with that, they can request their birth certificate and get the process started. Um, but that's something that a lot of our folks who are experiencing homelessness have a ton of trouble with having the correct documentation to just prove who they are and get access to the services they need. Um, so SNAP uh, benefits would be a lot larger in here, but we actually have the Neighborhood Leaders Program is offering assistance. So that's one of the organizations we've collaborated with. And I think we can go on to the next slide because I think I talked about that next. Yes. Um, so the Neighborhood Leaders are offering services in the lobby to assist people to sign up with um, for SNAP benefits. They are a community partner with DFACS for that. So they have the partner, partner portal. And um, so we send a lot of folks who are signing up for SNAP benefits their way. And that's super valuable and is one of the reasons our numbers for SNAP are pretty low because we do get a lot of questions about that. And a lot of questions about the follow up parts like uploading their documents and, um, and the interviews. There's a lot of missed interviews. Uh, we have also worked with the Athens Area Homelessness and Poverty Coalition. That's the group I mentioned earlier that is a collaboration between local organizations that try and help folks who are dealing with homelessness. Um, and it includes all the local shelters and other organizations. And um, they're the ones who do the point in time count that Trudy also mentioned. So the Athens Area Diaper Bank, um, this is actually a new collaboration that we just started with them to have uh, diapers available in the children's department bathrooms. Um, so just not like we give out a whole month's supply, but just we've got a few if there's an emergency that comes up. If someone's a little bit low, they can maybe take a couple for later and just make sure that diapers and clean diapers is not going to be a barrier for a family accessing story time, accessing books, um, getting out in the community and being able to access the library resources. So we're both really excited about that. They, they think it's a great idea to offer them at the library and we're really excited to offer that too. And in the future, I'd, we'd li I'd like to expand that to more hygiene products as well in all the bathrooms, but one step at a time. Um, and then the Advantage Homeless Day Service Center is another collaborator of ours. We have talked to them and know what their different programs are, who is eligible, because they have several different programs that all have very specific requirements. And we've talked to them about how if someone does really need to have um, be walked through an application or they're having trouble finding housing, they can come to us and we can help with the apartment searching, the house searching, the applications. Um, so yeah, that's just a few of the things we've done so far. And it's one of the really exciting parts of doing this at the library. So we're planning on having many more. Okay. So going to the staff part of it again, um, the, there is a lot of potential impact of working with uh, traumatized individuals. And so some of those are compassion fatigue, burnout, secondary traumatic stress. Um, I already kind of mentioned that the pandemic has been hard on library staff. I know it's been hard on everybody, so I'm not gonna, <laughs> I know everyone knows that, but um, we want to try and figure out how we can help as much as possible. 
So you can go to the next slide. Um, so some things that can be done, encouraging team unity, supportive and encouraging connections, learning to embrace challenges, celebrating accomplishments, uh, clear and transparent organizational supports, building in fun, encouraging self-care, and the importance of empathy. Um, so a lot of these are kind of creating a culture that is supportive, embraces challenges, celebrates accomplishments. I know the library does a, a get caught um, program of accomplishments where all of everyone brags on everybody else and then they, they send out the whole list of what everyone's done and, and then someone gets chosen to be in the spotlight that month. But it's really nice to just know that what everyone is doing is being noticed and also to see how hard everyone else is working. Um, and then encouraging self-care is something that the social work interns have helped with in the past. And so that's something that I would like to start back up again. But the social workers, the social work interns provided some opportunities for self-care. They did a little workshop. There was a, a mindfulness session. Um, and so that's a way that we can kind of work together to help with some of that. And then just the importance of it, empathy in the trauma-informed care is understanding the context where people might be coming from. You know, it might be, um, we don't know what someone's history is when they come into the library. And a lot of the time it's not about us. It's about everything else that's been going on in this, that person's life. Um, I like an example actually from when I worked retail, but I asked someone for their, their membership card and she just started crying. And it turned out that it just reminded her of a family member who had just died and her family had, had the family member had had that membership card. And so I keep that in mind is a, it's not about me, like 90% of the time, at least it's, it's not about me. It's what's going on with them. Um, and it's providing a safe, safe place and approaching them with empathy and understanding. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I already pretty much said that these are some of the things we do, but having this option for staff support, thank you, Trudy, for already saying that it's really appreciated, um, but just all of the staff members I've talked to, a lot of times they'll just be like, well, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, they really appreciate having an option to give. Um, one of the risk factors for burnout and compassion fatigue is basically being asked to do stuff that you're not qualified for or feeling like you don't have the resources to help. Um, and so that's one of the main things that we can help with is to have another option um, to support our patrons and, and help staff feel, know that they're, they're making a difference. Um, so Trudy talked about this. This is something we're still implementing, I'll be honest. Um, but we are to continue to be a trauma-informed library uh, with trauma-informed spaces. We want to have onboarding where in the initial introduction, we introduce staff to the concept of trauma-informed practice, what it means, how to recognize trauma, um, and, and how to deal with individuals who might be having um, trauma issues. Uh, and then continuing education. So we have an annual staff development day, an annual day where the library closes and all staff from all of the branches come in and there's continuing education opportunities about cultural competence and trauma-informed practices. Um, the cultural competence is one that's been there as long as I worked at the library. Like I said, the library does have a focus on also addressing um, some of the historic inequalities. And then trauma-informed practices is something we're going to make sure we include going forward. And then support and reinforcement, just creating basically a trauma-informed culture. Uh, so the social work, well, social worker and social work interns can model trauma-informed approaches um, and we can support the staff in self-care and self-awareness. And um, so that's one where we have made ourselves available to staff to come talk to us privately. And sometimes a couple people have taken us up on it at various times. And I think I'm in a unique position 
because I was staff before. So these were also my coworkers. Um, and I have worked on the, at the desk, the, on the book floor. Um, so it's also a matter of peer support and providing um, empathy for staff too. Okay, so, and then policy. Also something that is still a work in process, which I'm gonna say being, having a trauma-formed approach is always going to be a work in progress. There is no particular check mark, we are done, finished forever. Um, it's always gonna require reflection, review, continuing to evaluate and reinforce the culture. Um, but so what we're doing is we are going to implement the suggestions from the UGA Partnerships Policy Review. Uh, they have a lot of good suggestions about more neutral language, about clarity and some issues. And they also had a fair amount of areas where they thought the library was also doing really well. Um, we're gonna continue to follow best practices and advances in the literature about trauma-informed spaces. Um, we are collaborating with other library social workers across the country through the Whole Person Librarianship Forum and the Library Social Workers Direct Practice Support and Supervision Group. And we are going to continue to include trauma-informed care in future plans for expansion and or new library buildings. We, have a, we are eventually gonna have a new library across town to have safe, calm, and welcoming spaces. So, okay. Um, so this was just some of what we've done so far. We've had 150 office hours. We've had 280 intern hours. We have had 113 sessions with patrons and we've talked to 83 unique patrons. We do definitely have people who come back. Um, I have somebody who I don't think she really needs anything anymore, but she likes to come see me every Wednesday. So, <laughs> um, and sometimes we have people just stop by and update us too. So that doesn't get counted in there, but it's always really nice to, um, to hear from that. And we also have a fairly strong um, word of mouth referral system with our homeless pat patrons. So a lot of times they'll say, oh, so-and-so told me to come see you. <laughs> so that's, that's really encouraging and um, I'm glad to hear that. So we have also been involved in community events. So there's been several collaboration programs with the Athens Homeless Shelter, some in their emergency housing and some in their more long-term housing where um, library staff went and created a program for the children. And we also had sign-up opportunities, library card sign-up opportunities for the adults. Um, our interns have helped with Bling Your Prom, they've helped with the Friends of the Library book sale, and they've helped with the Homeless Coalition's point in time count. So we don't have the new results yet, but we will hopefully have just a little bit of a snapshot of who is currently experiencing homelessness in our community. Um, we've involved, been involved in a lot of community meetings, so community connection meetings, homeless coalition meetings, and then we are continuing to reach out to other organizations to let them know what we're doing and um, find out what we need to know when we send people to them. Um, we have been creating social service posts where we do little short lists of local resources on different topics. Just, I think that's very fitting as the library's role of being an information center as we are letting people know what's available. Uh, the collaboration with the Athens Area Diaper Bank. Um, and then just, we've had several people, we've had a couple, well, yeah, we've had one person get several jobs is actually what that is. Um, and we've, we've helped someone get into an apartment. She was couch surfing. Um, we've helped patrons get free phones, get access to the affordable connectivity program, which is $30 off your internet every month, connected people to the social security office, to food stamps, to the VA, um, lots of just different things that come up. So um, it's, we have, um, we have ve had very appreciative patrons who didn't know we were there, but have felt that we offered a valuable resource for the library. Okay. So suggest some suggestions for other organizations as far as where to start. Um, you can just go on to the next one. So encourage an organizational culture that fosters resilience, considers people in their context and listens to client voices, uh, provide staff training on trauma, what it looks like, 
offer staff training on cultural competencies, ensure that staff have access to both professional and peer support, um, have an expert review your policies for clarity, inclusive language, and to avoid re-traumatizing clients, and create programming for diverse populations that nurtures and celebrates culturally specific protective factors. Um, so these are all things the library does and is continuing to work on. And there's also some good resources online. Um, there's a link to a website that both has free training and resources for paid consultations um, that I can put in the chat if you all would like. Um, so I don't actually have a final slide. Um, so thank you. I think we can we can take any questions. If you guys would like to put the questions in the chat box right now, I've seen a lot of um, praising comments and shout outs to Athens Library, the people who have been there. And it's just awesome to see the impact just from that one quarter that your program has, knowing it is a part time staff and interns. That was some amazing impact. I had a question about the curriculum. You said that um, there are some available online. Um, if there is a link, even if you send it to me afterwards, I would love to see what you guys use or what is, um, you know, out there that you guys have found great. Okay, yeah, the traumainformedcaretraining.com, um, they have both a list of free resources and kind of more advanced if you want to uh, pay them to consult. They have a mentorship program. Um, it's one that the, the TILT program initially, the UGA folks recommended to us. So we've had that with um, in bringing in new interns as part of our training. When I just put that in the chat box. Yes, I just saw that go up. Thank you, that's the right one. And we have a question from Mary Eleanor, she says, would love resources or ideas on how to make physical changes to space to make it trauma informed. Because I think even like the physical environment really informs, you know, demeanors or how we interact. Um, I feel like that's not, I'm not really sure what all spaces. I, I think a lot about noise um, in the library and ways to have it be not too loud or not have intrusive noises, um, people yelling, or and try and have the spots where the kids can yell be a little bit separate from the adults, because we definitely have some loud after school kids. Um, overall, I mean, I think a lot of it's in design choices and construction. I think our building is nice to look at. We have soft, comfortable furniture. Um, Trudy, you might have more insight into this particular question. Actually, actually, I don't. I was thinking about that. That was, I think when we were in the grant, we were supposed to do like an environmental scan, um, but because of the pandemic that, that didn't get done. So I, I actually, uh, unfortunately can't offer anything on that. I think probably any guidelines for public spaces are probably gonna have the basics down. Um, and I think libraries definitely start at an easier place for that than say doctor's offices, which often do kind of feel a little bit more clinical or un unwelcoming maybe. Um, libraries have always tried to be a welcoming, friendly space. Awesome. We have another question. Is there a particular resource or tool that you utilize in terms of culturally specific protective factors? You talked a lot about being even culturally informed within your library. Um, was that part of the trauma-informed process or how did you guys implement that as well? Um, there is, with the initial grant, they created a number of trainings that are PowerPoint slides on different topics. Um, so that is something that we have as a backup, but overall the library does just have a diverse staff that does try and do a good job of offering diverse um, programming for people. Um, 
and a diverse collection. I mean, with the library, it starts even at the collection level of what materials are we making available on the shelves. One thing we did in our second, this was the pandemic year of, of the grant and um, they got an extension and some more money um, from IMLS, but we actually incorporated a lot of uh, social justice aspects into the grant. Um, one thing that we did that was very successful last year was we did a community-wide read of uh, Stamped, uh, the, the children, not the children's version, but like the teen version of Stamped. And um, we had community readings and programs for that. Uh, lots of agencies partnered with the library. And it culminated with um, the three authors of Stamped, uh, Jason Reynolds, Ibrahim Kendi, and Cherry, I can't remember her last name, that wrote the children's book, were all on a webinar together. And the first time all three of them had ever been, it was a webinar, but you know, presenting together. So that was part of the social justice aspect of the grant and how the library really uh, works towards that and tries to inform and be active in the community. <laughs> 